first of all, thanks everybody for joining today. This is going to be the first of several training seminars that uh, that we present. And the plan behind all of this is to take you from step one, you know, from A to Z, basically, of turbocharger knowledge and basics. Today will be our very, very first step of the journey to understanding the turbocharger lineup. And then as we get more involved into some of this, we're going to be talking about things like how to match a turbo, how to optimize your entire turbocharger system. So again, thanks for joining today. And just so you know, our application engineer, senior application engineer, Harut, will be presenting all of the tech topics. And once we get through the presentation from uh, roughly around 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, we'll open it up for Q and A. And what uh, the way you can have your questions uh, answered would be to um, put them into the comment section and we'll go through each of those comments. So part one of, of this seminar, we're going for TurboTech basics and, and fundamentals. And that's what, uh, that's what you guys are joining here today. So again, thank you for joining. All right, thanks, Tim. Yeah, my name is uh, Haru Stepanian. I'm an engineer here at Garrett Advancing Motion. Um, been with the company for, for a long time. And um, I'll walk you today through some of the turbocharger basics. We'll go, uh, we'll talk about, like Tim said, the turbocharger ranges that we have for like the OE side, the aftermarket side. We'll talk about some turbo basics, uh, different components of a turbocharger, and then some, uh, some operating conditions, uh, operating limits as well. So let's get started here. Um, this first slide here shows the, our, our broad turbocharger range. So Garrett Advancing Motion is a, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a large turbocharger company. So we have a big OEM side to our business and we develop all kinds of turbochargers, you know, ranging from uh, small, really small sizes from GT06 uh, sizes to GT70 sizes, uh, different turbo te charger technology. You know, we have micro turbos, small wastegate, uh, different types of uh, VNTs, and then a large, large wastegate and an extra large wastegate for large off-highway vehicles. So this chart here, just to get a little familiar with it, on the y-axis shows the compressor wheel diameters. So the exducer diameter of the compressor wheel, the large diameter. That's what the y-axis uh, is showing here. So the different types that we have. The x-axis is showing uh, uh, engine power in kilowatts, ranging from uh, up to 250 for, uh, kilowatts for gasoline and up to 1500 for diesel applications. And then on top of these, uh, these bar, bar charts here, you can see that's the inducer diameter of the turbine wheel. So just a lot of information shown here, but just it's, it's basically showing how wide range of turbochargers we have for all types of applications for, for the OEM. So ranging from 0.6 liter engines all the way up to, to six liter and even larger. Um, and that's what these, uh, these pictures of this car. So this is a Tata Nano that utilizes a GTO six turbocharger. And then you have uh, these mine trucks that use four GT 70 turbochargers uh, for, uh, to, to power the vehicle. And then um, some, some aftermarket um, turbochargers shown here as well. So different types of technologies, we're always developing new technology. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen in, in recent news, we you know we're, we're working on, on e-turbo, we're working on um, fuel cell turbocharger technology and different things. So always, always you know, looking to the future and also have to remember our, our history, we have a long history of turbochargers um, starting from you know, the, the T-series all the way up to, to the recent uh, e-turbo stuff. So. A lot of different range, a lot of, a lot of engineering goes into this. Um, a lot of you know CFD, FEA, a lot of testing, 
a lot of durability testing to make sure that the turbocharger is going to survive different customer customer conditions, uh, no matter who the customer is. So that's what I wanted to show here. And um, now we'll we'll go into what what everybody here is most likely interested in is is the aftermarket performance category. So this is where where all the fun stuff happens, you know, and showing the different uh, different turbo families that we have ranging from GT to, to G series. So the GT, we have frame sizes from 20 to 35, all the way up to 675 horsepower with displacements from 1.4 to four and a half liter. And then that evolved into the GTX Gen 1, then the Gen 2 as well. And then we also have GTW turbochargers, which are uh, journal bearing and ball bearing variants of uh, 34, 36 and 38 frame sizes that um, have capability of up to 950 horsepower. And then our latest technology turbochargers, which are the, the G-Series. So those are mostly, mostly MARM turbine wheel, high turbine inlet uh, temperature capable turbochargers up until the, the 35 frame size, but the increased Sealy capacity, uh, different turbine housing options, uh, improved uh, compressor and turbine aerodynamics to give you maximum horsepower in the smallest package possible. And that's rated anywhere from 300 to 3000 horsepower. So the G57 turbocharger has a capability of up to 3000 horsepower and uh, displacements from uh, 1.4 liter to 12 liter for the G series turbochargers. So we have frame sizes from 25, 30, 35, 42, 57 and, um, and more to come as well. And images, some images here showing different uh, turbocharger setups for these uh, performance turbochargers. You have single turbo, twin turbo applications, you know, triple turbo compound systems, anything and everything. So anything your heart desires, you know, you wanna build, you wanna make, we have uh, turbochargers for it. Um, whatever you want, it'll, it'll fit, make the, make the power and um, be compact as possible. So let's get into some uh, some turbocharger knowledge. Let's talk about the designation because you know we always talk about um, GT25, GT35, different uh, model names of the turbochargers. So I'm sure a lot of you already uh, familiar with that, but let's just remind ourselves and um, go through where we started with the T-series turbochargers. So just to give you an example, there is a T04B59. So this one specifically, let's say, was a for a Komatsu application. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have, have heard of the uh, the Komatsu brand name for uh, for for tractors and things like that for uh, machinery. So the TO4 in the model name is the frame size. So we always talk about frame size. So that uh, that relates to the size of the turbine wheel. So TO4 in this case. It means it is a 74.2 millimeter turbine wheel. So that's on the in, on the X uh, inducer, sorry. That's a larger diameter here. So you can see the infographic here for a turbine wheel. The inducer is the larger diameter. That's where the air exhaust gas enters the turbine housing in the turbine wheel. So that's what we go off of for the frame size. The B in the TO4B59 stands for the design of the turbocharger so that letter can change depending on the design level. And then the last two numbers, 59, used to mean the uh, specific um, TO4B that was made to a customer. So these are some old uh, designations. We don't use this anymore. So um, the evolution moved us on to the GT series. Um, so you've seen a lot of those, uh, I'm sure. So GT25, 30, 35, so this example here is a GTX 4088R turbocharger. So the, the 40, the GT40 uh, designates the frame size. So this is a, a specific size of the turbine wheel. I think in this case, it's about a 77 millimeter inducer for the, for the 40 frame size. Uh, the two numbers after that, uh, that coincides with the compressor wheel exducer diameter. So the larger diameter of the compressor wheel, which is the exducer. 
uh, and that's called the exocer because of the way the air enters in through the compressor side. So the inducer is where the air enters. So those are the inducer blade, uh, inducer blades, and that's the diameter here. And the exducer is where the air exits the compressor wheel and then out of the compressor housing. So that's what these two numbers are. They're the exducer diameter. So just uh, an example, I'm sure you've seen like 4002, or uh, let's, say, let's say it's just two numbers here, right? It's always gonna be two numbers if it's a 102 millimeter compressor wheel. So it's a large compressor wheel. We, it, it's not gonna say 40102, it's gonna say 4002. So that 02 means it's a 102 millimeter exducer compressor wheel. You also have uh, some, some letters to, to go along with the designation just to identify some of the features of the turbocharger, not everything. But in this case, we have a, you know, we evolved from a GT to a GTX. So X stands for a forged, fully machined compressor wheel. So that's what the X is. That was uh, an evolution. And then the R at the end always specifies a ball bearing cartridge. So it's a dual, dual ball bearing cartridge. And that's what the R stands for. And then moving on to our latest technology turbocharger, which is the G-Series. So G-Series, uh, we changed the designation around a little bit to try to make it easier um, for people to, to be able to identify the turbocharger and understand its capabilities. So we still, uh, we still retained the, the, the G25. So the 25 is the frame size. So in this case, uh, the example here given is a G25 550 and a G25 660. So again, 25 of this is the frame size that coincides with the diameter of the turbine wheel inducer. So in this case, it's about a 54 millimeter uh, turbine wheel. And then the remaining digits, whether it's three digits in this case or four digits, that identifies the maximum horsepower rating of the turbocharger. So here we have 550 and 660. So it's rated to 550 and 660 horsepower. So, you know, there's this max horsepower rating. It's, it's also dependent on the setup of your, of your engine, of your vehicle. That's very important. We, we give you the maximum, but that doesn't mean, you know, you're gonna put this turbocharger in your car and it's gonna make instantly 550 horsepower. That's not true. Everything else has to be aligned. You know, you have to have the proper, um, let's say fuel injectors, fuel pump, air, air system, intercooler, so all of that stuff has to, has to align as well in order to, for you to be able to reach this maximum horsepower rating of the turbocharger. That's just to, to give you a designation. And when you go to our website, we actually give you a, a range um, of a horsepower capability for each turbocharger. So that's, you know, that, that's pretty much it about our model, model designation, talking about T-Series, GT, GTX, um, G-Series, as well, we also have, you know, um, mix in there the GTW as well, the, the three frame sizes that we have available. So let's move on. Um, let's talk about um, the elevation advantage of a turbocharger. So a turbocharger, what this infographic is showing is that a turbocharger retains power at altitude. So this non-turbocharged truck shown here, what happens is when you increase in altitude, this, uh, this, this is showing in meters. So when you increase in altitude, the power is gonna drop for a non-turbocharged vehicle. But uh, with a turbocharged vehicle, this blue line here, your power is gonna remain constant. So you're gonna have consistent power um, as you gain altitude. Obviously, you're still gonna reach a limit to a turbocharged vehicle as well because turbocharged via, uh, turbochargers have limits, they have speed limits. They have um, temperature and pressure limits. So eventually as you gain an altitude, your pressure ratio increases, uh, your turbo speed increases, and you wanna make sure you're not uh, going past the, the rated uh, turbo speed of the turbocharger. Because once you do that, you can have problems with the turbocharger and possibly eventual failure of the turbocharger. So that's very important um, to note. Uh, so the reason why a turbocharged engine, turbocharged vehicle can uh, retain power 
at altitude is that imagine a, a bottle of like a, a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or soda. You know, you have, you have, uh, you empty it out. Yeah. You, you close it up. There's air in there, right? There's, let's say one, one uh, soda bottle of air in there. What a turbocharger does is it compresses that air. So you're, you're able to fit, let's say six bottles of soda into that one soda bottle, right? So you have a ton more air um, for the engine to consume. So you have more air, you can, you can provide more, more fuel and make more, more power as you need. So let's move on. Let's talk about some of the components of the turbocharger. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's a lot of different names out there for, for some of these components. We'll, we'll try to, to try to hit on some of them. Let's start off with the, the turbine housing. So this is where you, you mount the turbocharger itself to the exhaust manifold, to the engine. And that's where the exhaust gases enter the turbine housing, enter the turbocharger. So the exhaust gases enter, they go around the volute of the turbine housing and eventually enter the turbine wheel inducer. So this is called the turbine wheel. And then eventually the exhaust gas exits the turbine stage, the turbine housing, the turbine wheel, all of that. So the turbine housing is also sometimes called the, uh, the hot side. So that's where all the hot exhaust gas passes through. So that's also known as the hot side. And then the turbine wheel is uh, connected through a shaft uh, to the compressor wheel. So that's what connects the, the hot side to the cold side or the compressor side. But there are components in between, like uh, either journal bearings or ball bearings, and then uh, the center housing, which contains all the uh, the oil um, oiling holes. So you have the oil inlet, the outlet, and also um, water cooling passages as well. So it contains all the important uh, rotating components, and that's called uh, the center housing. Or overall, when you combine all of this, sometimes it's called a CHRA. It's also known as a center housing rotating assembly. You also have sometimes a, a back plate which connects the center housing to the compressor housing. So with the compressor housing or cold side, what you have, you have the air entering uh, this way into the inducer of the compressor wheel. The compressor wheel compresses that air and then exits the compressor wheel and then goes into the volute of the compressor housing and eventually exits into the engine or the, the inner cooler. And then you have, you, know, you have different features of the turbocharger as well, like a speed sensor port. That's, uh, that's important. We, we recommend having that. So then you can, you can identify what speeds your turbocharger is running so you're not overspeeding it and uh, causing extra stress on the turbocharger. So those are the main components. You obviously have, we have other components. You have actuators. You have uh, internally waste gated turbine housings as well. Um, so different different components as well to a, to a turbocharger, but these are the main ones that we, that we always reference and we talk about. So just how a, how a turbocharger works as part of a system. So, you know, in, in an in OE world, um, the benefits of a turbocharger are fuel efficiency. Right, so with a with a turbocharger, what you can do instead of having a V8 engine making a certain amount of power, you can have a V6 engine with uh, with a turbocharger. So with with that, you, you can um, you can make the same amount of power because of the turbocharger compressing the air, and because you have two less cylinders, you're using less fuel. So that's why it's uh, it's more fuel efficient when you run a smaller engine with turbochargers instead of running a naturally aspirated V8 uh, or something like that. So that, those are the benefits of downsizing for an OEM application, but for the aftermarket applications, you know, it's, it's a little different because what you want to do is you want to make maximum power for, for a certain, certain engine for a certain setup with, with the turbochargers. So that's what the turbocharger aids is, uh, is in making as, as much power as you can um, and, and try to be as, as efficient as possible. So what this thing, infographic is showing, just showing some of the routing of, of the plumbing. So this is, let's say your, your engine, and this is uh, the, the exhaust, uh, 
the exhaust gases flowing into the turbocharger and then exiting, and that's connected, uh, the turbine wheel is connected through a shaft to the compressor wheel, and that compresses your amb ambient inlet air, and then um, eventually goes into an intercooler, which uh, cools down the air a little bit, because uh, as you compress air, you're, you're heating it up. So what you try to do is you cool it down with a, with a charger cooler with an intercooler before it goes into the engine. So that's, that's the basic, uh, basic, basic function of a turbocharger. Um, so let's, let's keep going. So just a little bit more about the end, end housing functions. So the turbine housing or the hot side, this is a V-band inlet, V-band outlet, uh, free-floating turbine housing. So free-floating meaning it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not waste gated. So there's no internal waste gate, flapper valve or poppet or any of those components. So this shows a cutaway of the turbine housing. So the exhaust gas enters in through, through the inlet you know, whether it's a V-band inlet or a T3, T4, depending on um, what, uh, what type of manifold you choose, uh, you have to choose the appropriate turbocharger to go with it. So what the turbine housing does, it accelerates the gas um, through the volute. So this is the inside of the turbine housing and it directs it to the turbine wheel. So on, on the compressor side, uh, this is showing a compressor housing. So what happens is when the air gets compressed, it goes through the volute. So air, the air slows down and increases the, the pressure. So that, that exactly show, wrote, written here, the volute increases in section towards the compressor outlet. So these are the functions of the end housing. Uh, or the main function, you know, it, it's, it's directing ex, uh, hot exhaust uh, air to the turbine wheel. And then for the, for the compressor wheel, it's directing compressor stage, it's directing it to, to your eventually to your engine. So, and then housings, uh, they also have a very important function. We, we, we put, you know, all our turbochargers through extensive testing. One of the most important tests that we do is called burst and containment. So BNC. So in, in the event if, of, a, of a compressor wheel or a turbine wheel exploding, let's say, you know, we run tests where we make sure that uh, the turbine wheel or the compressor wheel is contained within the turbocharger. You know, we, we don't want any, any uh, pieces of the wheels flying out of the end housings and uh, you know, damaging property or hurting someone. So that's very important uh, test that we do. Again, called burst and containment. I'm sure you can you can look up some some videos and stuff online um, to see to see that that type of stuff happening in the field. But for our turbochargers, we we always run that test. That's very important to us to make sure that our turbochargers are qualified. And that's just one of the many tests that we do. You know, we we run run our our turbochargers through through FEA. Through, through CFD, we run durability testing, performance testing. You can find all our compressor maps and turbine maps online to be able to help you do matching, which we'll go over through uh, in, in future live events. Quickly touch on um, yeah. FEA and uh, you know what those mean. Yeah, so FEA is finite element analysis. So what you do in FEA is let's say you try to predict how the how the turbocharger, how the turbine housing is going to react when you have hot exhaust gases flowing through it. You have vibration um, and things like that. Uh, so you do an analysis uh, before before you run testing, just um, just to make sure the design is qualified properly. And then CFD is computational flow dynamics. So what you can do with CFD is predict uh, try to predict the performance. So when we have new, you know, new compressor wheels or new turbine wheels that's run through CFD to make sure that it's going to be an improvement over our previous design. Okay. So let's go over turbo system integration. So turbocharger itself, you know, it, it's a very complex system. As we said, we, we run it through a lot of uh, extensive testing. 
But a turbocharger is also part of a bigger system, right? It's, it's part of the engine, it's part of the vehicle, so uh, which has a lot of uh, different parts to it. So, you know, the turbocharger is part of the air management system, which means your air filter has to be clean, you know, your, your hoses and everything have to be connected properly, your intercooler has to be sized properly. That's important. Turbocharger is part of the exhaust and emission system, you know, because you're using the exhaust gases to power the turbocharger, to spin the, the turbine wheel. Um, and the exhaust and emission systems have, you know, exhaust gas recirculation valves or coolers that are integrated sometimes into the turbocharger. Uh, you also have your, your catalyst, like your catalytic converter, that's part of the system. So the turbocharger is part of that system as well. The control system is very important. So how, how the turbocharger is controlled, you know, you have, you have an external wastegate or an internal wastegate, and that needs to be controlled. So you have maybe the ECU controlling it. You have, you have inputs, you have feedback, you have all types of sensors. So the turbocharger is integrated into the control system as well. So the lubrication system here highlighted is very important because, um, you know, installation of the, of the turbocharger is very important, connecting the proper uh, oil system to the turbocharger, making sure, because the turbocharger utilizes the engine oil uh, itself. It doesn't have a separate uh, oil pump or oil system usually. So it, uh, it utilizes the engine oil. So you need to make sure your oil is clean. You need to make sure your oil is uh, properly filtered, uh, cooled and then making sure your installation is, is correct, which we'll talk about. So you're, you know, obviously your oil pressure is very important, um, especially for you know, ball bearing turbochargers. They do have a limit for oil pressure because once you go beyond, let's say about 40, 45 PSI of oil pressure to the turbocharger itself, you can start pushing oil out of, uh, into the compressor side or the turbine side. So oil pressure, is very important for a turbocharger. And then finally, obviously, the, the turbocharger, you install it onto the engine, onto the manifold. So all of the general condition of an engine is important. Blow-by is important for the oil system as well, because if you have a high, if you have high blow-by, you know, that means you have high, high oil, pre high pressure in the oil pan. And that, what happens is you're not allowing the oil from the turbocharger to drain properly into the oil pan. So it's gravity, it's a gravity drain, it's not pressurized. So the oil inlet is pressurized, but the oil drain is gravity drained. So you need to make sure it's as straight as possible and then making sure that it drains above the oil, uh, oil level in the oil pan. So, you know, well, like I said, the, the turbo is part of a big system. It's very important that, um, that it's installed correctly and uh, the whole system is maintained properly. And that way your, your turbocharger can survive for a very, very long time. And then lastly, let's talk about some, some turbo operating conditions. So turbochargers obviously have, have limits in every way. Um, you know, we, we qualify turbochargers to a limit. Obviously there's material limits, there's rotational limits, um, there's stress limits. So all of that, like you know, we talked about is, is uh, analyzed through FEA and through testing. And we come up with the proper limits for the turbocharger, depending on what, what material it's used, what level of technology it is. So let's, let's talk through some of that. So in terms of ambient uh, temperature entering the compressor side, so the cold side, so that's qualified anywhere from uh, negative 30 C to 40 C, which is negative uh, 22 Fahrenheit to 104 Fahrenheit. So that, that has a range as well that's, that's qualified. We need to make sure um, that we're following these, uh, these limits. So another important uh, thing is the exhaust gas temperature, which is your turbine inlet temperature. That's the exhaust gas temperature coming out of the engine. And that's important to, to monitor as well. Typical diesel applications, uh, diesel turbochargers that we have, 
they're, uh, they're rated to about 850 degrees Celsius. And then our latest gasoline technology, so the G-series turbochargers, those are rated to 1050 C, so 1050 degrees Celsius, which is over 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because of the new, the new MARM technology turbine wheel that we're using. We're using stainless steel turbine housings. So it's, it's capable for, for that high of a temperature, which means you can run, you can run, run a, a leaner setup to, to make more power and the turbocharger will be able to survive. So the, the lubricating oil also have as a limit, um, it's, it's rated up to 150 C, which is 302 Fahrenheit, which, you know, if, if you're already running that temperature, that means you're having other problems in the engine. Uh, so you need to make sure that uh, you have proper, proper oil cooling as well, and maybe even, you know, water cooling through the turbocharger. So all of that stuff is important. Uh, most importantly is uh, turbo speed. So turbo speed is very important. You know, we, we, we qualify these turbochargers to, to these limits because um, we know if, if once you start going beyond these limits, be, besides uh, turbo speed, temperatures, pressures, you might start to have problems with the turbocharger and possibly eventual failure. So, just to give you some, some examples um, of uh, how, how fast the turbocharger can spin. So looking at, let's say a GTO6 uh, turbocharger. So that's the frame size, it's a very small turbo. That turbocharger spins uh, up, up to an over 300,000 RPM. So that's very fast. Um, while a, you know, a GT70 turbocharger so our, our large frame turbocharger has a big turbine wheel. It spins up to 63,000 RPM. And those are like the limits of the turbocharger. So one place you can find our, our limits is the website. So when you look at our website for each turbocharger, you can find the compressor maps. And on those compressor maps, when you look at the, the last speed line, so the highest, this is, this is what's called a speed line. Um, that's at the highest pressure ratio, that line is your speed, that your highest speed line. So circled here, this one specifically has a speed limit of 145,000 RPM. So, you know, because compressor maps is one thing we'll, we'll go through later on. But um, just to show you an example of where you can find the speed limits, and just to give you an example of how fast the compressed, like a typical compressor wheel spins, is uh, just, these are just different units, but basically spins up to 1300 miles per hour. So that's at the tip of the blade. So the exducer of the compressor wheel spins that fast. So that's, that's twice the speed of sound. So that's really fast, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something not to take, take lightly. Uh, turbo speed limits are, are very important. We need to, to follow those limits. We need to abide by them. Uh, the best thing is to, to have a speed sensor. That's the only way you can, you can, uh, you know, you can data log it. You can have a, a speed gauge, turbo speed gauge, and be able to monitor that as well, along with, you know, other typical things that you monitor, like uh, coolant, uh, coolant temperature or pressure or EGTs uh, as well. So that's basically it um, for today. We, you know, we went through, through our turbocharger range. We went through turbo model designation, some turbocharger basics for components, um, how the turbocharger works, how it operates, and then also some of the important limits of the turbocharger that need to be, need to be followed when uh, installing a, a, a turbocharger. So I think that's it. Back to you, Tim. Um, let's see if there's any any questions from from people. Sure. Yeah, and it looks like there's uh, there's quite a few questions. Ruth, thanks for uh, going through all that. It's always a good always a good um, you know time to um, relearn from some of the basics. So this is definitely really good info to uh, to share. And um, yeah, so let's get into some of the questions. There are quite a few. Um, 
and let's see what we have. All right, so we have Andrew Farley. He has a GTX 2867 on his Mazda Speed and says it's performing really great. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. That's fantastic. Seems like a good match for that engine displacement. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's pretty good. Hope you're enjoying the, the turbocharger. We have Mike Lewis from Turbos Direct is also here and one of our distributors. And one thing to, uh, to point out as well is, you know, if you are looking for more information on any of the products, um, we do have all of our performance distributors that can be found on the website and you can call them up for any questions or even any product ordering. Um, they have been in the industry and distributors for Garrett for so long, um, just a, a, a wealth of knowledge um, so we really encourage you also to rely on distributors for additional info. Okay, uh, and a question we get a lot, uh, this one's from Derek Stewart, when will the e-turbo be available? Um, so, I mean, it, it is available in certain OEM applications, um, but as far as performance, um, you never know. I mean, it's it's something that uh, eventually I think might be a product offering, um, as long as there's enough demand for it. But uh, fruit, what are your what's your take? Yeah, I think along the same lines. Well, we we you know we always look at um, technology. You know, our, our OEM side is always developing as well. So we try to learn from each other. And um, like you said, it's it's not out of uh, let's say out of question. It's always something we're, we're looking at. We just don't have a timeline for it yet. Yep. Okay. And so Mario Cox is pointing out the quad turbo setup that Haltech put together on the uh, LSV12. Um, I don't know if that was in. That one is different. It's different. Um, okay. That was from a different builder, but yeah, Haltech did the did the quad turbo setup on uh, using four GTX thirty five eighty twos, two standard, two reverse. Very cool uh, display engine that they take out to some of the races. Um, I think they had that at PRI. Um, very very cool setup there. Um, probably I would imagine pretty hard to uh, to tune and, and get dialed in, but yeah, very cool. What, it's very cool what people can do, you know, when they put their minds to uh, to the setup. As you see the different engines on the screen right now, um, you've got a single, you've got a twin, you've got a triple turbo setup and a quad turbo setup. It's uh, always always exciting in uh, in this segment of the business with racing and performance. What's the craziest setup you've seen, Harut? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, these, these quad turbo setups are pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. You, you know, you, you see all types of stuff online. Um, with someone putting a uh, turbocharger for each cylinder. So there's some, there's some crazy stuff out there for sure. Okay, Jamie has a question. Um, so what turbo would be best for a two liter um, Honda sport front wheel drive. So I think, you know, I think when it, we're, we'll get into matching in another, um, in another seminar, um, another live session here. And there's just, there's so many questions we would need to ask you back to find that out. Um, Harut, what are just some of the basics when matching, uh, when doing a basic match for uh, yeah. even set up? Yeah, I mean the basic mat basic match is is uh, horsepower displacement and what you're trying to use it for. So the, those are the basic things, and we can we can recommend something or the distributors, like you said, uh, can recommend something. We also have Boost Advisor um, on our website that you can go through. So those are the basic things, and it's a recommendation, right? So it's 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 really based on our our experience, what we've seen. And so the more information you can give us, the, the better match we can give. Obviously, you know, you're not going to be able to give us like temperatures and pressures for in, going into the turbo, out of the turbo, all that stuff, which would definitely make it um, a more 
specific match. I think mo most people won't be able to give that type of data like an, like an OEM type of uh, customer would. But at least with uh, those like few things, we can we can give you a basic recommendation. Like I said, uh, Boost Advisor is a good start, and then you go on to our distributors, um, which are very knowledgeable and can recommend uh, the proper turbocharger for your application. Right. Yeah, and the uh, the support front um, class is a seventy two millimeter inducer. So those options, you're, you're definitely very, very limited to some of those, um, very, very limited to, to the options when you have a inducer limited class like that. So, right. Yeah. But, uh, but again, we'll get into some, some more matching stuff in a, uh, in, in later videos. Um, so Steven, Steven Borg, when is the G40 turbo coming out? So we have, um, we did make an announcement uh, last year around SEMA time that the G40 would be the next uh, one of the next products to be launched, and we can guarantee you that it will be this year. Um, but uh, but when that is, we cannot tell you at the moment. You'll just have to wait and see. So check back with the website or social media, and uh, we'll give you the updates as soon as the products are available. Okay. Um, let's see, what do we have next? Eduardo is joining from Argentina. Hello, Eduardo. Um, uh, so here's an interesting question from, uh, from Jake Bailey. Um, have you guys done any testing with any aftermarket wheels? Um, I think, so no, the answer to that is no. When, and Harut can talk on this a little bit more, but when, a turbo is engineered. We're engineering it with our best arrow, with our most efficient arrow. We are, you know, designing a product to um, to flow within the, the the housing ranges, and um, you know, we don't go out and look at other companies' products. And I would say to you, if if there's if there's a need to change a compressor wheel, you're probably better suited rather than taking the Garrett apart, which could leave it unbalanced or you know, who knows what damage could happen putting it back together or maybe not even torquing the wheel to the right specs. Um, you, know, you could have some other bigger problems down the line when, when modifying a product. So we definitely don't recommend it. Um, and then Haru, is there anything you want to, uh, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, when when we like you said, when we develop wheels, we have we have PhD scientists guys that are that are working on this. Um, we have specific wheels and aerodynamics groups that develop compressor wheels, turbine wheels. You know, there there's groups of uh, there there's a, a team that works on on developing these to um, to improve upon what we've done before. You know, and and changing out a compressor wheel or looking at an aftermarket wheel, you, do, you don't really know how it's going to perform, right? We, we display all our compressor maps, um, all our turbine maps on our website. So you know exactly what you're getting. So you, you can look at the pressure ratio, you can look at the flow, the efficiency, um, all of that stuff. When you look at an aftermarket wheel, it's just, you know, something, so a wheel someone that just maybe changed a blade or, or did something different and saying oh yeah this is better so obviously they're trying to sell you something but it's not engineered as as well as you know a, a garrett uh wheel would be engineered yeah i would say if, if there's no compressor maps or flow maps to really uh to show then um you, you may want to take a second uh second thought about doing something uh like that in upgrade. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you're right. When you're modifying a turbocharger, you're you're completely changing. If you're changing a wheel or changing something on it, you're changing the character the characteristics of the turbo. Mm -hmm. You know, our turbochargers are individually uh, balanced out of the factory. Mm -hmm. So, and and like you said, it's it's torqued to a specific spec to make sure that it's not going to come apart. Yeah. Okay, and Shannon Braun has. Um, is asking about twin scroll, um, you know, on the turbine housings. Um, you know, we don't, uh, we, we have some twin scroll options in certain uh, frame sizes. Um, 
but maybe what's what's your uh, what's a quick thought on on um, twin scroll and how that helps perform under certain applications? Yeah, yeah. I mean the twin, so the mono scroll versus twin scroll or divided twin volute, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's going to help you with the getting a quicker boost response. So that's what that's doing is is it separating the pulses of the engine um, going into the turbocharger, and that increases the efficiency of the tur overall turbocharger and gives you a quicker boost response. Usually, the downside to that is the peak peak power capability that a uh, let's say a mono scroll turbine housing would give you. Um, your with the twin scroll, you're going to have better boost response, but you're going to peak out early. But with the mono scroll, you might have a little later boost response, but you're going to have a higher power uh, potential. Yeah. So it just, it just depends on your needs, what you want to do um, with your with your application, right? If, if you're throwing it on a dyno and just trying to make a ton of horsepower, you usually want like a mono scroll. If, if you're trying to, you know, doing some autocross or something like that, and you want quick response, then uh, you, you you know a twin scroll would be would be better. Yeah. All right. And Petra Zelazko, what's the difference uh, between a five, six, seven, or eleven blade? And does the blade count actually um, give you an increase in efficiency, or does what does the blade count actually do right. with the performance of the turbo? Right, like like we mentioned that you know we have a specific wheels and aerodynamics group that tests all of that information. So in terms of blade counts, that really doesn't mean anything. Um, it's all about the the blade shape, um, you know, the, the different parameters of the compressor wheel, and how that's optimized. So there's each each uh, you know each let's say blade shape has an optimal number of blades. You can't just keep adding blades and make more power or more efficiency out of it. You're going you're gonna to peak out and eventually the performance is going to drop. So uh, again, all of that stuff, all of the, uh, the wheels are run through CFD, through performance mapping to optimize the, the number of blades and blade shape and all of the other characteristics of a compressor wheel. And there's a few comments on uh, on tip speed of the compressor wheels and yeah. uh, just the extreme mile per hour uh, that that these turbos can get up to. It's really 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 impressive, and I think it's something that um, you know I think we fail to respect about what a turbo is doing. Yeah, uh, and you know it's only when you point it out like that you really you know I guess it, it's like have a, a newfound respect for what it's doing and you know you you learn to um to be more safe around them and, and really keep them in their operating limits because everything does have limits and um you know exceeding those could you know could be um you know putting premature wear and and um you know, maybe even um some some damage to a, a turbo or your engine or something if you're going over those if you're not really yeah mind those ranges yeah exactly i mean we we try to we qualify all our turbochargers for bursting containment so as you see this turbo if, when it spins 1300 miles per hour tip speed um some things can go wrong and if they go wrong and if your housing's not qualified properly your turbocharger is not qualified um and you're standing on a on a drag strip and you know, waiting for that that car to launch, and you're right next to the car. That's that's pretty dangerous if if you don't know that the turbocharger is properly qualified, right? Because it just it just takes one time. We we've you know we've seen some some online videos of uh, other turbochargers where wheels are flying off and hitting cameras and things like that. So it's it's a, it's a very dangerous thing, right? Um, when something is spinning that fast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, now uh, the next question is: In an OE world, is the cool down procedure necessary? And how about in aftermarket applications? Um, so, in an OE world, right, you have these new these new cars with stop start technology, right? So that's that's very important. We always uh, recommend 
um, trying to cool down the turbocharger, cool down your engine before shutting it off. With the, let's say, OE turbocharger is when an OE customer comes to you and says, hey, I, I have these specific statement of requirements. I need it to stop and start at a stoplight. Um, so, which means, you know, you might be running it hot, you come to a stop and the engine turns off. So we test for all of that. So we test stop start technology on our turbochargers. We have what's called a heat soak back test. So we, what we do is we run the turbocharger uh, in a laboratory in a gas stand. We, we cut off everything at once and see how high the temperatures go and make sure they're not above our limits. So all of that is, is tested. Um, we always do recommend uh, trying to cool down your, your engine before shutting it off, um, right? You, you wanna try to cool it down. Same thing, what you do with your brakes when you're on a track, you wanna cool it down. You wanna do a cool down lap before you come off the track. So it's, it's something similar, you don't want anything to be overly hot, right? That's, that's not a good thing. Yeah, good point. All right, now uh, internal wastegate benefit versus external. Internal external is, is more of packaging. Um, with an external wastegate, you have uh, flexibility on the sizes you can choose on an external wastegate. Right, you, you, have, you have options with that, but with an internal wastegate, you're stuck with that poppet size that the turbine housing comes with. So internal wastegate is, is great for, let's say, low boost applications, for uh, applications that have really tight packaging and you don't have somewhere to put an external wastegate. So it, it really depends on, on your usage, your application, what you're gonna do with, uh, with the turbocharger. Okay, next one is, do you guys do sponsorships? Um, and yes, so the answer to that, Mario, we do uh, We do have a sponsorship form that you can fill out. It is on the uh, website under the racing and performance category. And it's called, uh, or you can go into the search bar and just type in sponsorships and it'll take you to that form. So we'll take a look at all of that and uh, you know, look at the different criterias um, and then if there is an opportunity, we would definitely reach out to you directly and, and uh, make something happen. So yeah, uh, that is available on the website and definitely check that out. So the next question, um, there's an F10 BMW M5. What would be suitable for the 1200 horsepower range? Um, I think we can, hurry, we can kind of cover that fairly quickly. Um, but again, it's like these, these um, quick turbo matches, again, are just very, very basic turbo matches and a lot more info needs to go into it. Um, yeah. And one thing to point out again is, you know, these are a bit more complex than just, hey, what creates, uh, what would make this horsepower on my vehicle? Because there's a lot of turbos that can, because turbos are you know, we, we classify them under engine displacement and horsepower ranges, but there's so much other um, components that go on um, that maybe a distributor would be more suited to actually walk you through and, uh, and help you figure out if something would work. But, you know, a 1200 horsepower range um, turbo, there's a lot of them in the Garrett lineup. There's everything from, you know, the G42, um, yeah. up to the GTX 55 or even the G57, those can all make a large range of horsepower, but it really comes down to a lot of other components and the fuel you're using and um, uh, yeah, many other things for anything you wanted to uh, yeah. add to that. Yeah, I mean, and then you, you can do, if you're doing a twin turbo application, you could do like twin twin G30s or G35s. So yeah, it, it, it depends on, I don't have too much experience with that with that application. Let's say I don't think there's uh, too many people um, turbocharging their M5, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's there's a distributor that can recommend something. But like you said, maybe a G42 or two two G30s or something like that. You know, I mean, it sounds like it'd be a pretty fun M5. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. 
Uh, okay, Luis Martinez, what about the uh, 2JZ engine? What's the best turbo size? And uh, I'll throw throw the ball back to your court. <laughs> it all comes best. down to the power. Yeah. Thing. I mean, you have you have uh, drag race cars that are running over 3,000 horsepower, um, you know, on billet box. And then you have your um, quote unquote, uh, um, what would you call it? Recreational track type of a vehicle or your drift car. So they're all going to use different setups. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a great engine. It's a very yeah. stout engine. If you wanted to use it for a, uh, even almost bone stock, all the way up to extreme fully built. And like best. I think I think Ryan Turk uses a G42, right? Yeah, yeah, and Dylan yep. Hughes. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, if, if you're not looking for that crazy horsepower, maybe like a G30 um, yeah. or a G35 would work uh, as well to yeah. to get it uh, much much quicker spooling. Yeah, um, and not you know like a twelve a thousand horsepower uh, to JZ, unless that's what you're looking for. So it really depends on what you want to do with it. Yeah. Um, okay, Stephen Tran, he's asking about tools. So yeah, we, we have the um, we have the boost advisor and it's a program you can go in, you can enter. Um, there's nine different questions we ask from horsepower to engine displacement range, what type of fuel you use, intercooler, and one of the most important things, elevation um, and air temp, uh, two of the most important things. So there's there's a handful of questions that you can go into. We do all the calculations for you on the back end, give you a graph and a couple of recommendations that would fall into line with the, uh, you know, with where that performance data falls on the compressor map. So if it is a match, you would be able to see where it performed and where it was plotted on the compressor map. Um, so yeah, Boost Advisor is something you can also find on the uh, racing and performance section of GarrettMotion.com. Okay, so moving on. Um, okay, we have a quick match question. We we only have a few more minutes, and then we'll have to uh, close out of this session. But there's uh, and anything we don't get to, we'll try to get to in the comments or even on the next um, lunch and learn here. Okay, so there's a GT3582 on an RB26, but looking to uh, go to G series, what would be the best G series for an RB26 without choking the engine? Um, yeah, it depends on if, if they want to increase the horsepower or not, right? If, if they want to stay the same frame size or they can go down a frame size, maybe like a, a G30. G3900 or something like that mm -hmm. to, to give them a better response and maybe the same same horsepower capability. Yeah, I think again, uh, the inputs for Boost Advisor would, would be a good start um, yeah. for this. So that way we know what elevation you're at. I mean, you have to kind of put the turbo into its conditions with air temps um, and elevation and, and power, uh, fuel type, those, things all kind of help determine, you know, the operating conditions of, of the turbo. So um, Boost Advisor is definitely something that's that does those calculations for you. Um, and then you can take that or, or call up a distributor um, to help further answer some of those a little bit more in-depth questions. Again, there's a distributor locator at the bottom of Boost Advisor that you can check out. And those guys will be help, happy to help um, further refine uh, a turbo match. Um, okay, let's say, let's see if there's any more. I'm skipping over a few. Would the G35 ever be offered in a divided T4 housing or is V band the best possible turbine housing? Yeah, so I think that's, that's something that we've been working on, right, Tim? That's something that's going to be going to be out soon. Yeah. Well, right now there's, you know, we did just release the T4. Okay. Uh, there you go. By with the T4, it's a T4 106. Um, but that is, and that is divided. Yes. So yes, uh, Steve Groff, that is available. Check out the website or you can contact a distributor for that. 
Uh, again, T4 1.06 for G30 and G35. Okay. And let's see, is there one last good one? I'm just scrolling through the rest, the rest of these. Um, will this slideshow be available for download? But John, the slideshow, um, we won't have it available for download, but this video will be saved um, on Facebook. So you can always go back to it and, um, um, and, and watch through the slides again and, and just sort of have that info at, uh, at your fingertips. And that was one of the well, one things we wanted to do with this whole series was start from you know, point A to point Z, um, go through a lot of the, the technical knowledge and info for turbos, how you, how you match, just the basics. We're gonna take you through a journey um, from beginner to expert. And uh, in future videos, we'll go over more complicated topics. Uh, we hope you will follow along. So we have a lot of interesting info, a lot of info that uh, you can use to really optimize the system, um, make sure that if you are having certain, uh, certain troubleshooting signs, we can um, take you through some of those troubleshooting guides. Uh, the great thing is Farouk will be on and, and we're gonna have a lot of info in future videos. So um, yeah, we definitely thank you guys for joining. Farouk, is there anything else you wanted to uh to go over before we before we drop off here no i think i think that's it um so hope hope everybody enjoyed it and learned something you know uh, i know a lot of people are knowledgeable and hopefully this was a refresh for some people and you know we all learned something thank you all right yep all right everybody we really appreciate it again thanks for uh thanks for joining and we will catch you next time. Thank you. All right. Thank you.